Schrodinger had this idea that there was quantum vitalism, and this, this could be the sign of it. This could be exactly what he was talking about. Well, thank you, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thanks to the organizers. It's been a fantastic event, having a wonderful time. I am gonna raise this question and I'm going to argue that consciousness came first and we'll, uh, you'll see why. Uh, people say, well, you gotta define consciousness. What do you mean by that? And that's true, but we also have to define life because it's not as uh, straightforward uh, as sometimes people think. So there are ways to define it, to describe it, functional approaches, Lynn Margulis Sagan, uh, as its function, self-organization, metabolism, growth, etc. But these describe what life does, not what it is. And a weather pattern, like the great uh, red spot of Jupiter, can have these traits. Complexity, uh, nonlinear dynamics, uh, chaos theory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But inanimate objects have these also. In the 19th century, there was vitalism. People talked about a unifying energy field, a life force, Elan Vital, pervading living systems. Uh, but this was based either on electromagnetism or forces outside science and with molecular biology, DNA, etc. Vitalism became taboo and ridiculed, actually. However, Schrodinger, 1935, in his book What is Life, suggested life's unitary oneness derived from quantum coherence and that memory was stored in aperiodic or periodic crystal lattices. But, critics say, biology is too warm, wet, and noisy. Uh, or is it? It's not. It depends where in biology you look. Uh, biology is not, uh, is not a monolithic slab. It's highly heterogeneous. We'll come back to that point. So, for example, where you find the quantum is where you find the organic chemistry. Aromatic rings are the basis of organic chemistry. They're hexagons of carbon with three extra electrons forming pi resonance clouds conducive to quantum effects. And uh, these are found, uh, they're inside biomolecules, they're oil-like, oil and water don't mix. So these, uh, these structures uh, get away from the water, coalesce inside molecules, for example, proteins, to avoid the water, and this is where the quantum stuff happens. So uh, these pi resonance clouds, uh, they're benzene, they go in your gas tank, uh, they're highly combustible uh, in bulk form. But in, when, you, they're, when they're arrayed in a ge geometry, uh, they have incredible quantum uh, properties. Graphene, for example, fullerenes, buckyballs. And uh, the pi resonance clouds induce uh, uh, van der Waals dipoles in each other, which attract, then couple and oscillate. So we start with two rings and the, the three bars are the extra electrons. And when they get near, the electrons in one repel the electrons in the other and they form a dipole and you have like two dipoles, two bar magnets and they attract and then they oscillate in terahertz. That's pretty fast. 10 to the 12th hertz, that's like infrared light. And that's what's happening when these, two, when these aromatic rings uh, get together, terahertz. And uh, they can also go in superposition of being in, in both dipole orientations. And uh, this is necessary in the conscious state and not just these rings, but in uh, complex microtubules and other biomolecules. And anesthesia actually acts by blocking, uh, blocking these oscillations and dispersing the dipoles. And that's basically how anesthesia works. You've got to figure out which molecules. When the aromatic rings have uh, tails on them, they call amphipathic biomolecules, like lipids, uh, proteins, uh, nucleic acids. They have a ring and then they have a polar tail with charge here, no charge here. These are uncharged, nonpolar. And the nonpolar rings attract, just like the previous slide, induced dipoles. The tails stick out and they form micelles, precursors to proteins and precursors to cells where the interior has these aromatic rings where the quantum stuff is happening and the tails stick out into the aqueous environment so the whole thing becomes water soluble. So in a real protein, uh, this is what it looks like. This is the protein tubulin, the basic the subunit of microtubules. And here are three aromatic amino acids, tryptophan, which has the indole ring, the five and the six, and is a major component of serotonin and psychedelics, phenylalanine uh, is a single ring, and tyrosine. And there are 86 of them in tubulin, which is a lot for that size protein. And the red spheres are where anesthesia acts to block, uh, block consciousness, we think, by blocking these dipoles. So uh, these, these make net dipoles, for example, here's one example going in this direction. And these can oscillate, and these lead to interesting properties. 
Now, if you put these in a, uh, the microtubules in context, inside neurons, uh, people think of neurons as a, a fundamental unit, but uh, that can't work because they're, they're way too complicated. If you look inside, you see all these microtubules processing information at a much faster, much uh, denser uh, information level. There's about a billion of these subunit proteins in each uh, neuron uh, oscillating at about uh, uh, 10 million times a second. So that's a lot of information processing going on. But what's the clocking me mechanism? So we model these as, as automata or computers back in the uh, 80s, actually. And the question was, what's clocking it? In the computer, you need some kind of uh, coherent oscillation. And we, we proposed Froehle coherence. And then my friend Anurban Bandyapade discovered in microtubules coherent oscillations at a number of different frequencies. So this shows his uh, uh, 10 years of experiments at three scales. Here's neurons. You can see the neurons. And the, the, these are the probes. Here's one microtubule with 10 probes on it. And here's a row of the tubulins with four probes. And in each case, he would apply an alternating current. So microtubules are insulators. But if you, uh, if you sweep the AC current, you'll find certain frequencies where they become highly conductive, almost superconductive. And these happen every three orders of magnitude. Um, so starting uh, at the slow end, the big end, in kilohertz, so hertz is where EEG is and where neurons act. Then, but you find kilohertz, 1,000 hertz, 1,000 cycles per second, a million cycles per second. And then you go here and you see the, the same kilohertz, megahertz, and gigahertz, a billion cycles per second. And when you get down here, you see the megahertz, the gigahertz, and the terahertz. And in each case, the, the, uh, the conductance pattern has a characteristic triplet of triplet uh, morphology. So there are three peaks, and each peak has three peaks. So you, here you can see in cross-section, three, and each one has three. And uh, these triplets of triplets are also found in DNA, RNA, and other molecules. And, and we'll come back to that. We think it's, it's basically a fundamental uh, indicator of living systems. And there's honor bond. So um, if you look at the big picture uh, of a neuron, so people talk about hierarchies in the brain going that way, larger and larger, slower and slower, networks and networks. But if you go inside the neuron, you get to the microtubule network at 1,000 hertz, a kilohertz, a microtubule at a, a, a million hertz, a megahertz, rows of tubulin dipoles, uh, a billion gigahertz, and tubulin the terahertz that we saw before. And uh, this is actually petahertz, so uh, 600 uh, terahertz would be along here. And this is where the dipoles oscillate and where the anesthesia acts to block the oscillations to take away consciousness. So is this uh, Schrodinger's uh, quantum vitalism. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Schrodinger had this idea that there was quantum, vital, uh, quantum vitalism, and this, this could be the sign of it. This could be exactly what he was talking about back in 1935, and also Froehle coherence. So we can call some of these putative signs of life, and because I'm, at the end I'm going to talk about looking for life in, in molecule, extraterrestrial molecules and other molecules. So what are we looking for? If we look at a molecule from an asteroid that might have been involved in the origin of life, what are we looking for? So here's a list of things we could be looking for. Coherent oscillations among aromatic rings, uh, phase coupling across frequencies like music, quantum optical effects like super radiance, which is a uh, quantum optical effect, time crystal behavior, the triplets of triplets, are what's called tr uh, time crystals. And uh, I'm coming around to the view, it's actually Anurban's view, that the brain is more like a time crystal than a, uh, than a computer. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. Entanglement among aromatic ring states, and Anurban's shown that between microtubules. Psychopharmacological effects, so if we get a molecule, these aromatic uh, rings from, from uh, an asteroid or somewhere in space, uh, do they have any, uh, they, they look like psychedelics? Do they have any psychoactive effects? So we, we hope to test those, for example, in cerebral organoids. Do they self-replicate or self-assemble? And do they bind to DNA or RNA? So these are putative signs of life that we might be looking for. Okay, we'll come back to life. So what is consciousness? Well, it involves brain information processing and various theories of consciousness. Look at the brain as a computer of simple neurons, what I call cartoon neurons, because they're empty inside and they only act at one, one uh, time, time rate frequency. Um, integrated information theory, predictive coding, which is actually a little bit, a little bit more involved and, and interesting. And then microtubule quantum processes, including our theory, Orca-Warr, which I'll come to in a second. 
So that's, uh, that's kind of the, uh, the computational view. And then there's uh, uh, fundamental features of reality that consciousness could be, in, for example, in Eastern philosophical approaches, Bohm's quantum potential, Roger Penrose's objective reduction, self-collapse of the quantum wave function as a process in fundamental space-time geometry. And this, this led to the ORCOR theory, orchestrated objective reduction in brain microtubules that Roger and I developed beginning in uh, the mid-1990s, and which you know, was ridiculed right from the start. It's still being criticized. Uh, the computationalists don't like it at all. But uh, they haven't, uh, th their theories haven't generated even testable predictions or results, and ours have. So um, I'm, I'm personally pretty, pretty bullish about it. Uh, and we'll see about everybody else. So um, uh, Bing, I use Bing to mean consciousness. So if you see Bing, it means that's where consciousness is happening. It's not an explanation. It doesn't tell you what it is. It says, uh, okay, that's where we think it's happening. So the, uh, the complex computation among simple neurons, very similar to AI, is basically taking neurons as nodes or switches or something with, connected by synapses in networks with layers, and you get an output. And the, the neuron firing is thought to be one bit. And this lends itself to, uh, to uh, computational models to make the brain into a computer. And that's basically what we've been getting for the last three three or four decades. And it doesn't work for a lot of reasons. They say the consciousness emerges from higher order network effects. So maybe there's a bing there, but I don't think so. Because these cartoon neurons are an insult to neurons. Uh, <laughs> seriously. And uh, this, the, 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 best, the top neuroscientists rely on the, these cartoon neurons. So there's something wrong there. So, for example, why are they an insult? Well, if you think they're cells, neurons are cells, right? And a single cell paramecium can swim, learn, avoid predators, find food, mates, and have sex. Uh, there's two, uh, this is kind of an X-rated slide here of, of two <laughs> paramecium uh, engaging. And ironically, that's the only time they're absolutely still. They're all moving around, they fuse, and they don't move for a, a minute or two. And uh, maybe they're having a bing moment. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> So microtubules are important in the brain. Uh, I don't have time to go into this except to say that Alzheimer's disease is, uh, is, is caused or is related to microtubules disintegrating and the tau protein which, which holds them together falling off and this leads to neurofibrillary tangles. The microtubules disassemble. You lose neurons, you lose synapses, your brain shrinks, you lose memory, you lose cognition and you're demented. And uh, all the money and the, and, the, and the research in this field has been going toward the amyloid plaques outside the neurons, which have very little correlation with the, uh, with the loss of cognition. Uh, what we should be doing is, is resonating the microtubules and treating the microtubules to stabilize them. Just a recent study about using Taxol, which stabilizes microtubules, showing benefit. And I think we can use ultrasound to resonate uh, microtubules uh, to get it, get it together again. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.